Good morning, everybody. So for the last three weeks, we've been talking about the, the person of the, the Holy Spirit. And, and Christians, if you're new to faith, let me just say this to you, or you're just considering faith in Jesus, let me just tell you that Christians believe in this concept of that God is Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three and one and one and three, three persons, yet one God. And, and it, indeed, it's a mystery, but don't, don't let the idea of this mystery wig you out too much. It's not like some really smart guys, you know, several thousand years ago got together in a room and figured out, let's, let's, let's believe in the Trinity. No, the, the idea of the Trinity comes out of the pages of Scripture. Uh, remember, there's four biographies of Jesus, and the first of those biographies is Matthew, and, and Matthew tells us at the very end, almost the last things that Jesus said, uh, teach us about the Trinity. Look at the screen there. It's Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 19. This is Jesus talking to his disciples on a mountainside, and here's what he tells them. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Now, would you read the rest of this with me? Ready? Go. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you see, Jesus says that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. And repeatedly through the rest of the Gospels and all of the letters of the New Testament, over and over and over again, we see that these first followers of Jesus believed that God was three in one and one in three. And indeed, this is hard for us to figure out. Over the years, I've had people explain it to me in some ways that are uh, somewhat helpful. You think of an egg, an egg has the shell, it has the white, and then it has the yellow part, the yolk, but it's still an egg. Or water, think about water. Water is liquid, it is steam, and it is ice, but it's still water, H2O. Three different forms, yet the same substance. Here's the deal. Don't let the idea, the mystery of the Trinity, wig you out too much. Uh, and here's the way I put it, okay? Who would want to worship a God that we could figure out anyhow, right? Right? I mean, God is grander than that. We just sang, how great is our God? You can't put God in a Petri dish and study him under a microscope. He's not a math problem that you can figure out. Here's what I want you to know. Now, Christians have believed that the Trinity, the idea that God is three and one, one and three, is a reasonable mystery. So we've been talking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the Bible. Remember that on Pentecost, the, the, the birth of the church, that the Holy Spirit came in a fresh and a new way. Now, we read about the Holy Spirit throughout the Old Testament and through the Gospels. But when we get to the, the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes in a new way, a way that they had not experienced the Spirit before. You see, through the rest of the Bible, the Spirit was given to a few people, a few special people. But now the Holy Spirit has come at Pentecost, and it's for all of God's people. For men and women, rich and poor, Jew and Gentiles. It, 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 the, the Holy Spirit wants to come and be in everyone and, and make the love of Jesus real in this world. Now remember that what, what happened on that first Pentecost is that 120 followers of Jesus, they, they got filled with the Spirit. And on that very first sermon that Peter preached, 3,000 people believed in Jesus. And from there, it just continued to explode outside of Jerusalem to the region around it called Judea, to where their enemies lived. So the gospel was going to enemies in Samaria and then just to the ends of the earth. The primary person who led the movement of Jesus, well, his name was Paul. And we read a lot about Paul's missionary journeys. And, and remember, these first followers of Jesus, they're living the New Testament that we read. There's no Bible, there's no buildings, there's no paid professionals, no Bible colleges, no seminaries, no Christian radio. They're just living the gospel, and they're sharing the love of Jesus in their ordinary lives. So Paul uh, arrives at a city called Ephesus. Uh, it's in Turkey today. Um, matter of fact, just a little parenthetical thing, Pastor Wes is uh, into the third month of his sabbatical, and he's going to be in Ephesus here in just a few days. And, uh, and, and we read uh, what happens when Paul gets to Ephesus, and it's in Acts uh, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, this missionary, took the road through the interior, and he arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? 
Now read this rest with me. They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now this will mess with your theology, right? They've heard about Jesus. They just haven't heard about the Holy Spirit. Now again, remember, they have no Bible. They can't Google it, right? <laughs> well, who is the Holy Spirit, you know? Um, they're, they're, living, they're living the New Testament. And, and we might even chuckle a little bit. I mean, how could they know about Jesus and not know about the Holy Spirit? And yet, can I say really lovingly to us, that describes many of us in church today. And we know about Jesus. And we, we love Jesus. We love what, what he did for us when he died on the cross and rose from the dead to forgive us of our sins. But for a lot of us, we're like these Ephesian Christians. And we don't know who the Holy Spirit is. Francis Chan has written this wonderful book called The Forgotten God. And he talks about how we North Americans have forgotten about this third person who indeed is not some of God or a part of God, but who is God, the Holy Spirit. He suggests, and I would happen to agree with him, that for a lot of us it has to do with our North American individualism. We're rugged. I don't need no help. I don't need no help. And yet I want to suggest to you that if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to get to know the Holy Spirit. You want to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. You want to learn to the, listen to the Holy Spirit when he comforts you. This morning, uh, before the 8.30 service, I got to pray with two women, one who lost a husband and one who is a widow who lost her pet. And the, both of them were heartbroken. And I got to pray with them and over them and invite the Holy Spirit to bring them comfort. And both of them wept and they said they felt the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And see, when you feel comfort when you're in a difficult place, that's the person of the Holy Spirit at work in you. But the other thing is true. It's the other side of the continuum. Like when you're going through life and you hear a sermon or a song or you're reading the Bible or you're just in prayer and, and you hear God correcting you, or sometimes I call it God takes me to the woodshed. Am I alone, right? You know, get the four by four upside the head, right? And, and I hear God saying, hey, George, uh, danger. Uh, that's, that's not good for you. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to be the power of God at work within us so that we not only sense his presence, but we know that we know his power. So last week, um, I suggested that in this series, Breathe Deep, that we can get out of breath, that we can lose our breath. And I suggested last week, one of the ways that the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament that we do that is, is when we grieve the Holy Spirit. We, we can make the person of the Holy Spirit sad by the words that we speak and by the way that we nurture our relationships or don't nurture them. That when we do that, we sadden the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit. But there's a second way that the Apostle Paul tells us that we get out of breath, that we sadden the Holy Spirit. And he says it has to do with quenching the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Excuse me. See, the word quench there is, oh gosh, here's that word. I haven't been able to say it all weekend. Shebnui. Okay, I can't even say it. New me is what it is. And it literally means to extinguish, to stifle, or to suppress. See what Paul is saying to us here. Listen to me, Christ follower. He's saying, don't throw water on my spirit in your life. Don't, don't extinguish the fire of the spirit in your life. So when I was in junior high school, I was filled with testosterone and was convinced I knew everything, right? I'm 13 years old. My parents were out of the house one night, and I was watching a baseball game. I don't even like baseball, but I was watching a baseball game. And uh, my, in, in every Puerto Rican home, um, there's a big pot that's filled with grease that they use to cook plantains in, fried plantains. And so my mother had one, and I decided I wanted to cook french fries because I'm just not that Puerto Rican. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little more gringo than I am Puerto Rican. So, so, um, so I was making some french fries and mom and dad are gone and I take the pot, I put it on the stove, turn it on high, go back to watch the foot or the best, the baseball game. And what did I do? I forgot about it, right? 
until I didn't forget about it, until I could smell. So I ran into the kitchen just in time to catch the pot going from smoke to flame. You know how hot you got to get grease to get it to catch on fire? Real hot. So I thought to myself, I'm either going to burn down the house or I'm going to stop this fire. So I got a pot lid and I put it on top of it. Bam! <laughs> Proud of myself. But I'm 13. I said, I wonder if it's really out. And I lift the lid with my face really right close to it. And just then, it gets oxygen and the grease goes whoosh. So now I'm scared to death, right? So I go get my next door neighbor, Mr. Randall. He puts the lid on it. He takes it out. He throws it in the yard. So now I've not only ruined my mom's perfect kitchen, but my dad's perfect yard. <laughs> and of course, they're pleased with me, right? That fire was destructive. The fire of the Holy Spirit is constructive. Because see, fire rearranges things. Fire changes things. The good fire of the Holy Spirit wants to help you discover your identity in Jesus. Did you know that you are a child of God and a person of worth? That you are made in the image of God? Would you agree with me that there are voices out there and inside here that don't want us to know that? Would you give me a yes on that one? Yeah. The Holy Spirit's fire, when we don't quench it, when we keep it burning hot, reminds us, oh my goodness, doesn't matter what anybody else says, I belong to God. We discover our identity. We develop to be more like Jesus. We become more like Jesus when we keep the fire hot. We become more like Jesus in attitude and in action when we don't quench the spirit in our life. And then we are deployed, discover, develop, deployed. We're deployed as his missionaries in the world. Would you agree with me that in a world where this week two very famous people took their lives, that there's a lot of hopelessness out there? And God wants us to move from these seats to those streets and offer hope to hopeless people. Because let me just say this to you, as important as this hour, hour and five minutes is here, what really matters is the rest of the week and how we live it out as missionaries because every one of us in this room is a missionary. Discover, develop, deploy. We have to keep this fire burning hot. So here's the question I want us to try to answer of this morning. How can I resist quenching the Holy Spirit in my life? What are some things I can do to keep the fire burning bright inside of me? This constructive, not destructive, this constructive fire uh, going and burning strong in my life. Let me suggest two things real quick. Number one, know my spiritual gifts. Say that with me. Know my spiritual gifts. Can I remind you that there's a difference between being selfish and being self-aware? When I'm selfish, I'm putting the focus on me for only my own good. Uh, I'm just saying, what's in it for me? But when I'm self-aware, I'm still putting the focus on me, but it's for my good, the good of others, and the glory of God. And so I'm saying, God, help me know myself, good and bad and ugly, because self-aware people, here's what I've, I've, I've observed. Self-aware people People who know they're good, they're bad, and they're ugly are genuinely humble people. Here's a definition somebody gave me of humility about 30 years ago. They said, humility is the capacity to step forward when your name is called and you have the gifts. It's the capacity to step backwards when your name is called and you don't. So a couple of years ago, my administrative assistant, Elaine, um, if you want to know who runs Grace Church, it's Elaine. <laughs> She's been with me for 22 years, the whole time I've been here. And Elaine uh, called me and said, the news press, our local newspaper, there's a reporter that wants to interview you. I'm starting to think, I'm pretty important. So the phone rings, I pick it up, it's a reporter, and he says, hey, Pastor George, want to ask you a question about something. I said, go ahead. He said, um, could you give us your uh, best comment about stem cell research? Now, I got a Bible degree, right? If this doesn't work for me, 
uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, all right? Now, there was this temptation inside of me to do what? To make a comment. And to say something that would be really stupid and make it on the front page of the news press. <laughs> In that moment, uh, by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit wasn't quenched, at least enough to allow me to step back because my name was called and I didn't have the gifts. I actually told the reporter, why don't you call my good friend, Pastor Dan Betzer, at First Assembly. He's really smart. Thanks. <laughs> Dan is really smart. Now here, here's the deal. Um, we, need to, we need to know our spiritual gifts because the Bible tells us in the, in the letters of the New Testament that every follower of Jesus is not only given the gift of the Holy Spirit, but individual gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're called spiritual gifts. And we've been given these gifts. Look, Paul defines spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Uh, read this with me. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So this week I sat down and wrote this definition. Here it is. Spiritual gifts are supernatural capacities, or capabilities, I'm sorry, given from the Holy Spirit to followers of Jesus that represent, notice the dash there, that represent the ministry of Jesus for the church and the world. Now, I want to take that apart real quick. Six little things. First, number one, it's supernatural capacities. It really should say uh, capabilities, but it's the same word. It means that, that, that followers of Jesus are given gifts that defy human limitations, I love in Alcoholics Anonymous, we, we talk about being powerless and about how we need a power greater than ourselves. What's going on in this world, can I just remind you, is not going to be fixed by natural power. Government, education, us smart people. We have limitations, right? We need supernatural capacities. And the Holy Spirit wants to give that to this world uh, number two, it's from the Holy Spirit. It's not like I muster this stuff up. It, he is the source of the supernatural capacities and capabilities. Number three, it's given to followers of Jesus. It's for those who've said, I want to follow Jesus. And they, they're for Christ's people that, that, that want to live out as Christ's followers. Uh, number four, that represent the ministry of Jesus. You see, listen to me. This may be the most important thing. You see, spiritual gifts, God gives you a spiritual gift so that you can use it and make God's love, the love of Jesus, real. You see, people need to see concrete expressions of it through kindness and compassion, through a warm greeting, through a cup of coffee, through a, through a, through a cold uh, a cup of water given in Jesus' name. Number five. Number five, for the church. You see, it's, it's for God's people. This is how the church works. One of my fears as a pastor is that we begin to think that, that the spiritual gifts are for the paid professionals or the people who, who stand on this platform, and that's just a lie. You have supernatural capacities in you. The question is, do you know them? And then number six, it's not just for the church, it's and for the world. It's when we use our gifts, when we're praying for people, when we use compassion, when we're merciful, when we use our creative gifts, whatever those gifts might be, it's so that it draws people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. Now, Paul wants us to, to know that these gifts, they're different, but they come from the same place. They come from the Holy Spirit. Uh, look with me at the verses that surround the verse that we just read a moment ago, uh, verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 12. Paul says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit, the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service. They're diverse, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. It's this beautiful mosaic, friends. This beautiful symphony where we all play our different instruments and we make this beautiful music for God that represents the total body of Christ. Let me just say it again. No single person has all the gifts. My fear is that in many churches, and I hope it's not true here, that in many churches, the only part of the body 
we ever see exercised is the mouth, the musicians and the preachers. And, and listen, far be it from I me, mean, we have over 100 ministries at this campus that are run by folks, uh, ordinary followers of Jesus. But have you discovered what your gifts are? Do you know what they are? You see, there are four places, if you want to make this notation, there are four places in the Bible that talk about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. That'll be easy. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. The next one's 4. Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Here's a list of some of the spiritual gifts. Now, there's a whole bunch of them. Is this all of them? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think this is many of them, but I don't think it's all of them. There's nothing in here that says anything about worship. This worship team, they use in their spiritual gifts for the good of the people of God and for the world. They're representing the love of Jesus. That's not listed there. So we want to help you discover your spiritual gift. This is real practical. In your message notes and on the screen is a website address, egracechurch.com backslash gifts. If you click on that when you get home, you can take this free spiritual gifts inventory, and it'll help you. Now, is it perfect? No. But it'll at least get you in the ballpark of kind of how God's uniquely uh, wired you. I mean, let me just tell you, my wiring is I function in two primary spiritual gifts. And when I do this, I'm most satisfied. My energy levels stay high. It's my gifts are leadership and teaching. And I, I've known that I was a teacher through most of my experience, Christian experience. But for many years, for 12 years, I took my leadership gifts and I put it on the shelf because I didn't even know I had them. And you know how I, I came to discover that I had the spiritual gift of leadership? Is I got invited to lead. Uh, 22 years ago, they asked me to come here and lead Grace Church. And it was then that I began to discover, hey, God's wired me to lead people. Do I do it perfectly? By no means. But uh, just like my teaching, it's not perfect. But we, we use our gifts to glorify God. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? If you don't, I want to suggest to you, you're putting a lid on the fire of the Holy Spirit who wants to construct in your life. Number two, number two, so don't just know them, use them. Use my spiritual gifts. Use my spiritual gifts. So if you gave me a gift at Christmas, and I would highly recommend that, <laughs> no socks or ties. Um, is it a gift if it just sits under the Christmas tree? Well, it's a gift, but it's not, it's not enjoyed. I have to take the gift and open it and use it for it to be enjoyed. And so the Apostle Paul writes a letter to Timothy. And he's worried that timid Timothy is not using his spiritual gift. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. You see, Timothy was quenching the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says to him what? He says, I want you to rekindle it. I want you to fan the flame. You know, when, you, when you're out camping and your fire starts to go down, you fan it, you throw on a little fuel so that it can burn bright again. Do you know I almost missed out on Grace Church? 30 years ago, I was graduating from college. And I was about ready to quit. I went to see one of my seminary professors. I said, I'm going to go see this guy, and if he can't convince me to stay in seminary, I'm going to quit. And, and, and this guy, Ron, is a good friend of mine, he said, he said George, um, you're preparing for ministry. Are you doing any ministry? You know your spiritual gifts. Are you using them? And I had to be honest with him and said, no, I'm, I'm not using them. He said, why don't, before you quit seminary, why don't you like find a place to use your spiritual gifts? Isn't it ironic that I'm studying to be a pastor but I'm not doing ministry. So I went outside of his office and there was a bulletin board and there was a church looking for a children's and youth pastor and I pulled it off. I called it. I ended up getting hired by that church and in that church was a 13-year-old kid named Wesley Howard Holtz. And I almost missed that and all of this because I wasn't using my gifts. Now, y'all might be saying, yeah, but George, you're, you're, like, you're like the paid professional. 
And that's true. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a paid Christian. I don't know how to best else to say that. But I want to introduce you to Mike Gannon. Mike, come on up here, Mike. Welcome, Mike, as he comes. Give Mike a big old hand. Say, hey, Thank Mike. you. Thank you. So Mike's a, a good friend of mine, a member, partner here at Grace Church. Mike, um, tell them a little bit about yourself, your family, a little bit about your ministry, what you're involved in here. So I was born and raised in Fort Myers. Um, I went to school at Fort Myers High School, went to college in Orlando at the University of Central Florida, uh, moved back here and met my wife uh, about 20 years ago, and she lived in Tampa at the time. Ended up moving to Tampa, lived there for, for 12 years, and our, our boys, Keller and Luke, were born in Tampa. We moved back here um, in 2007. Okay. We found Grace Church and um, became involved and, 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 and just um, really uh, began to, to learn more about uh, what my spiritual gifts were and uh, was given opportunities to grow and to use those gifts. So what, what ministry are you serving? What's your primary ministry here? So primarily right now is uh, Nika Grace Ministries. Uh, actually today, uh, 10 years ago today, I was in Nicaragua for the very first time. Wow. And so it's, um, it's just funny how God does things like that. And, and I've been passionately involved with Nicaragua over the past 10 years. Um, it's, it's been a, an honor to, to be a part of that ministry, to see how God uses Grace Church and, and us to, um, to just come together as the body of Christ. So Mike, those eight, eight churches and pastors, Mike, Mike, not Pastor George or Pastor West, Pastor Arlene, Taylor, Mike leads that ministry, and he's the one that stays in contact with those pastors. And so over the years here, so since 07 to now, um, you've discovered your spiritual gifts. Uh, what yeah. are they? And, so, uh, and, 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 and how, did you, you know, how did you discover them? So my spiritual gifts are faith, uh, exhortation or en- encouragement, and leadership. And uh, I learned that uh, a, a few years ago. And then uh, through Bible study, through uh, relationships and, and people that God has placed in my life, through taking one of those tests like uh, we talked about earlier, um, I learned that those were my gifts. And when I learned that, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a, a, a big moment in my life because I, I've, I felt like, okay, if these are gifts that, that God has given me, then, then I need to learn how to use those gifts. Um, and as I've, I've learned how to use those gifts, I've realized that um, you know, when you combine faith and encouragement with revelation, then that's the spiritual gift of prophecy. And so I've, I've learned that I've also received the gift of prophecy in tongues, and it's, um, it's just an adventure. It's yeah. an adventure, and it's awesome, and so, I love so, it. So uh, those spiritual gifts that you've discovered, it's only for here at church, right? <laughs> no, it's, no, it's everywhere. So, so that's the challenge is, okay, I have these gifts, and how can I use those? And one of the, the practical ways that I find myself using uh, my spiritual gifts is coaching soccer. You know, I coach my boys' soccer team. But whether it's coaching a soccer team or it's uh, leading a mission team or it's being on the Nika Grace operational team uh, or if I'm in an operating room and encouraging a surgeon, it's, it's using those yeah. spiritual gifts. So you use your spiritual gifts in the church and in the world. I, I try to. Okay, all right. So how, how would you say that as you've grown in your self-awareness of your spiritual gift that your relationship with God has transformed and changed? It just, it just keeps growing stronger and stronger, and, and God just keeps, um, yeah, I pray for God to use me, um, and, and he, it's a dangerous prayer to pray. I think, yeah. I, think I learned that one from you, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, but it's, it, it's made me a, a stronger person, a, a better husband, a better father, a better brother, a brother, better son, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Hey, would you join me in thanking God for Mike real quick? Thanks, thanks, Mike. Thank you. So Nikolai uh, Paganini was a great violinist in Italy. And uh, just before he died, uh, he willed his world-famous violin to the city of Genoa where he lived. But he only had one condition on willing it because it was a very expensive exclusive kind of deal he said uh, you can't use it you have to put it in a museum 
Now, here's the thing he didn't know about the wood for his violin. When it doesn't get used, it just deteriorates. And so what was once a beautiful instrument is now a useless relic. And I wonder how many of us have taken these amazing gifts that God wants to make beautiful music through you and we've put it on the shelf. You see, God's given you his Holy Spirit. He lives in you. Don't quench the Spirit, church. Let's stand. So, Lord, we pray that you would teach us to know you, O oh, sweet Holy Spirit. We welcome you into this place. We welcome you into our lives. And even as we sing now, Lord, as we sing this song that we've sung here so many times, Lord, would you make it a desperate prayer of our heart? Holy Spirit, we indeed welcome you. We welcome you. Not just in your presence, but in your power, we welcome you. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to end the series but we're not going to stop talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen? And um, this could be an opportunity for some of us this morning to experience the Holy Spirit. Some of us are out of breath, saddening or quenching the Spirit. I don't know which it is, but you and the Holy Spirit do. And so whether it's where you're sitting or here at the altar, I invite you to pray and to make this song that we're singing your prayer and say, Holy Spirit, I, I need you. I want to know you. I want to learn to listen to your voice. I need your comfort. I need your conviction. Holy Spirit, speak to me. I, I want to encourage some of you to make your way out of your seats and come up here and pray. Mike's here. He'd pray with you. I'm here. Taylor's over here. We'd, we'd love to pray with you. Got some of our prayer teams. We would just, we want to pray with you that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you who he is and that you would learn to listen to him that you wouldn't be one of those Ephesian Christians we know Jesus we just don't know the Holy Spirit so the altar is open make this your prayer